I want to talk a little bit about that in a moment, but I want to ask you if you would join me in a word of prayer as we be, begin this message that God has given us. Father in heaven, thank you for this morning. We pray that you would send your spirit to fill this sanctuary, that every person here would sense his presence, that we would know that you were here right beside us. We pray, Father, that you would teach each one of us something this morning. May we leave here knowing that, that you have talked to us through your word. Father, you have given me a message that you want me to bring, and I pray that if you have other ideas or, or I'm not doing justice to your word, that you would just push me out of the way and, and take over, that it would be you that speaks, not me. Lord, we are honored, as Jane said, to be able to live in this country, all the privileges that we have, and to comfortably come here this morning to praise and worship you. Bless us, Father, as we hear from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to thank Jim and Jane and the worship team and Sharon uh, for your involvement this morning. My message title is actually Confusing Times Calls for Strong Faith. And when we look at the state of the world, look at the state of our province, even our community, sometimes we can't make sense of what God is doing. Sometimes we get rather frustrated because he doesn't do what we think he should do, or he does things that we don't know what is going on. Why would you do that? I've had on my mind this last few weeks the terrible incident that happened in Manitoba. A busload of people heading off for a, a day of fun with friends. And you know what happened. Fifteen of them were killed. I thought back to years ago, four young RCMP get up in the morning and get dressed and say farewell, and they go off to work for the day, not thinking that it would be any different than any other day. And the four of them get murdered in Merthorpe. The Humboldt bus crash. A couple that you probably don't know, uh, Brendan and Melissa, they're missionaries in South Africa. They're from Sherwood Park Alliance. Young couple, two little kids, come home for a year's sabbatical. All four of them get killed in a car accident. And then we've come out of this COVID situation. That makes no sense to me. So what do we do? How do we respond to God when he does things or allows things to happen that make no sense to us? How do we respond to him when we are confused and we're upset and we're angry and he doesn't seem to answer our prayers? You know, when things like this happened, many of us ask why. Why don't you do something different? Why do you allow this to happen? Why are these con things continuing to happen? Why doesn't God answer my prayers the way I want him, when I want him? In a few minutes, we're going to look at a book called Habakkuk. It's in the Old Testament, and many people think when you think of Old Testament books that they don't apply to us today because that's old, ancient history. But this book is really a modern book that applies to us this very day. I want to give you a little bit of context. One of the things I don't know is how much you know. I don't know <laughs> how much teaching. So if I am going to tell you a bunch of things you already know, just bear with me. There are 17 prophetic books in the Bible. All of them in the Old Testament. Five are called major prophets and 12 are called minor prophets. Major and minor is not a, a reflection on the importance of the book, but rather the size of the book. In my Bible, the five major prophets take up 169 pages. The 12 minor prophets take up 62. The book of Habakkuk is small, three, three chapters, 56 verses. Usually when you think about prophetic books, what happens is that God speaks to a prophet. The prophet turns and tells the people what God said. But this is the only book where that doesn't happen right away. In this book, Habakkuk actually talks to God and they have a conversation through a couple of chapters. And Habakkuk is very upset. 
Eventually, he goes to the people, but not until he gets a few things sorted out. Now, you'll remember the 12 tribes that left Egypt. They uh, left and they're headed to the promised land. They get to the promised land. Joshua is ready to take them in. Ten of the tribes go to the north. They become Israel. Two tribes are in the south. They become Judah. And it's Judah that we're going to talk about this morning. Judah starts off great. They've got a wonderful king named Josiah, who's a God-fearing man. Everybody loves him, and the nation of Judah is going well. Judah passes away, and then we have a series of four young, corrupt, non-believing kings that rule Judah. And Judah goes downhill quickly. It plunges headlong into a cesspool of corruption, immorality, idolatry, and it plagues this nation for years. This nation of Judah, God's chosen people that came out of Egypt, is at its lowest point in its history. Enter Habakkuk. Now we know very little about him. He's only mentioned in this book. We don't know how old he is. We don't know where he came from. We don't know how long he's going to be around. We don't know his background. All we know is that he's a dedicated man of God and he and God have a conversation. When Habakkuk sees the terrible moral decline of Judah, he prays. And this is how the first two verses open up. The oracle, the oracle that Habakkuk the prophet received. And Habakkuk's complaint How long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you don't listen? Or I cry out to you, violence, but you don't save? How come you don't listen to my prayers? How come you don't answer me? I've been praying and praying and praying and nothing from you. That's probably where some of us are today. I could assume that some of you have been praying for certain things your entire lives and God just doesn't seem to answer. You've prayed a long time for a variety of things. Habakkuk is confused, he's irritated, he's upset. And he wants to know why God. Pretty gutsy if you ask me to confront God this way. How long must I call for help? but you don't listen. Or I cry out to you violence all around him, but you don't stop and save people. Just a side note, I found this rather interesting. <coughs> if you look up the word violence and you look it up in Hebrew, the word is Hamas. And some of you will know right away that Hamas is the name of the militant Palestinian group. They're Muslims and they've named themselves violence. You know, I think sooner or later all of us wonder where God is when we need him. Where is God when our church needs him? Where is God when our province needs him, our country needs him, our families need him? We see things going on all around us and we don't know where God is. We pray for wayward children who've just gone astray and there's no answer from God. A young couple may pray for marital problems or financial struggles that they're having and they don't seem to get an answer. People pray for their health. We prayed for a lady this morning, I understand, who's been in this church a long time. We pray for health and there doesn't seem to be an answer. And this list goes on and on and on and we pray and we pray and we pray. And God seems to be silent. In Psalm 10, verse 1, it says, Why, O Lord, do you stand so far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? I want you to know that there is nothing wrong with asking God questions, questioning things that happened because it has to do with the motives behind the question. It has to do with the condition of your heart when you ask the question. 
if you are coming to God and demanding answers as if I know better than you, then you're heading into the problem territories. If you are questioning God and questioning his authority, you're, you're not going in a very good direction. These are going to cause some problems. But if, however, you question God with a sincere understanding and you have a sincere love and faith in him and a genuine concern for God and his people and his world, then there's nothing wrong with asking God questions. It's all about the condition of your heart at the time you ask. After 42 years of marriage, my wife passed away a couple, of week, a couple of years ago. She lost a battle to cancer. And I have to be honest with you, I was like Habakkuk when that happened. I was very angry and I was very challenging. Why would you do this to me? Why wouldn't you take me instead of her? She is worth more to you on this earth than I am. She has done far more for you than I ever have. After that initial anger was kind of settled down, I came to a place where I could start to ask God, what do I do now, God? What do you want me to do now? What am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to handle this? We were together 45 years altogether. We dated for three and were married for 42. My wife actually led me to Christ. She's the first one that ever read a Bible passage to me, Romans 8, 28. I was struggling with a bunch of things in my life, and she came into my life, and that's the passage she read. For we know that all things work together for good to them that are loved by God and are called according to his plan. And I was angry as ever. But as time went on, I settled down, and I began to ask from a sincere heart, what do you want me to do now? I'm yours. Direct me. Teach me. I know that God doesn't answer our prayers and our, th the way we want him to and in the time frame that we want him to. But I want us to realize this morning that we don't understand his plan. We don't understand his mind. We can't see the future. Many of us don't even know what's good for ourselves. Isaiah 55 verses 8 and 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. You know, when we think about God not responding, there's a number of things that we need to kind of think through. Maybe we're not right with God. Maybe there is some unconfessed sin in our lives that we've never taken responsibility for. Maybe that's what's getting in the way. Maybe we're not in a place in our lives where we would understand anything about answers to prayer. Prior to my wife introducing me and leading me to Christ, I knew nothing about scripture. I knew nothing about God. I grew up in a very dysfunctional home. So anything anybody would say to me would make no sense to me. Sometimes when we pray about things, our answer has been given to us, but we just don't see it. Maybe our prayers don't align up with what God has in store, the big picture. Maybe we don't live long enough to see. Maybe we're so singly minded that we won't accept what he has to say. Don't confuse me. My mind's made up. This is the way I want it. Maybe it's about timing. His timing versus our timing. Maybe we need to just accept the fact that he's the boss, he's in charge, he can do what he wants, and we don't have a say in the matter. Now, I know that's a little harsh, but maybe that's it. You don't even know what I'm doing. There's something going on here much bigger than you realize. So in verse 2, there's uncontrolled chaos. Habakkuk is upset. He's angry. And then in verses 3 and 4, he continues on with his argument. Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrong? 
Destruction and violence are before me. There's strife everywhere, and conflicts abound. Therefore, the law is paralyzed, and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous, so that justice is perverted. Why is the world seemingly ruled by wrong? Why do the bad guys seem like they're winning? Well, God has a plan, and Habakkuk's going to hear about it, and he's not going to like this. Verse 5. So 1 to 4 is Habakkuk's first complaint. Why is all this stuff going on? You're doing nothing about it. Verse 5 is the first of God's response. Look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed. For I'm going to do something in your days that you would not believe, even if I told you. Habakkuk is probably thinking, I know. He's going to bring us a God-fearing king, and then everything is going to be good. He's going to find a guy to come in here and overrule, and they'll take a few years, but we'll be back to the people, to God's chosen people, the way we were when we arrived here. But then we read verse 6. God says, I'm raising up the Chaldeans or the Babylonians. That ruthless, impetuous people who sweep across the whole earth to seize dwelling places not their own. The Babylonians were the most hated people in the nation, in those nations. God just says to Habakkuk, you know who I'm going to bring in here to fix this? The great Bible villain, King Nebuchadnezzar. He's going to send Babylon in to take control of his chosen people. Does that make any sense to us? Not a bit. Matter of fact, listen how God describes the Babylonians. These are the people I'm calling in to take over Judah. They are feared and a dreaded people. They're a law unto themselves and they promote their own honor. Their horses are swifter than leopards and they're fiercer than wolves at dusk. Their cavalrys gallop headlong. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like vultures swooping to devour. They all come bent on violence. Their hordes advance like desert winds and gather prisoners like sand. They deride kings and scoff at rulers. They laugh at the fortified cities. They build earth ramps and they capture those cities. Then they sweep past like the wind and they go on. Guilty men, all of them, whose own strength is their God. He calls in the meanest kid on the block to tune in his nation of Judah. He picks the worst to punish his chosen people. And none of this makes any sense to Habakkuk as it doesn't make any sense to us. But hold on. Even though this seems like an odd thing, Why would God use evil people and evil intentions to punish his followers? He's done that throughout scripture. I'll give you two examples. When he has used evil people with evil intentions for godly good. Jacob. His brothers sold him into slavery. You know the story of Jacob and all the years and what happened. And in the end, his brothers come to Jacob in Egypt. And Jacob says, brothers, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. God used some evil brothers for good. Here's another example where evil men did something. They crucified Christ. God allowed evil to crucify his son. What they meant for evil, God meant for good. God can use ungodly people for godly outcomes. So as we think about this whole story, this whole situation, there's a few things I want us to think about. First, we only see part of the picture, as I said When it comes to understanding God and what he's doing, it's like we're standing here holding one piece of a puzzle, of a thousand-piece puzzle. 
After my wife died, I stayed at home and made dozens of puzzles so I didn't know what to do. And I'd take one piece and I looked at it from that piece, I could not tell you what it was. It wasn't until I got the frame in and started working to the middle, then it would start to make sense. We don't understand the big picture. We don't know the whole picture or what God is looking at. We only have one little piece, and it's our piece. It's our prayers with our wants and our desires, and we just can't understand it. Habakkuk's mind is messed up because he thought he knew what God should do. But we need to understand that we serve a God who's bigger than my ideas, and he's bigger than yours. We serve a God whose ways continually surprise us. See, God had a plan, but Habakkuk would not see it unfold for 66 years. 66 years later, Judah was freed from the Babylonians like they were freed in Egypt. Maybe it took Judah that long to get it together. Maybe it took that long for another force to take over and control Babylon. We don't know. We only know part of the picture. Nineteen twenty-five. There's a seven-year-old, messy-haired little boy in Sunday school, wearing blue jean coveralls. Probably one strap on this side is not done up, and it's laying flat. You know the kid. Teachers there teaching him, "Jesus loves me. This I know." She looks at this little kid, this seven-year-old piece of the puzzle. 25 years later, that Sunday school teacher hears this seven-year-old boy who's now 31 preach a sermon. She went up to him after the service and said, Billy, I can't believe you. Billy Graham. As she looked at that seven-year-old boy, she had no idea what God was going to do. The world had no idea what the world, what they were going to do. Billy Graham. 74 years ago, someone had a vision to plant a little church in a small town in Alberta. The church was Alberta Beach Alliance. And I'm sure at the time when people came up with that idea, people were thinking, why would you go there? Why would you plant a church in Alberta Beach, wherever that is? No one understood the impact that this church would have for years and years and years, and you don't even know about it. I worked in Hannah, Hannah Alliance Church, for a year, helping them find a new pastor. There was a Sunday school teacher there who had taught Sunday school for 28 years. She didn't know this, and I had to tell her that one of her students graduated grade 12. He, he went through all of her Sunday school teaching. He graduated grade 12, went to Bible school, called as a pastor to Drum Miller Alliance, was there for three or four years and then left and he's now in Cochrane. Cochrane's a church of about 400. But it started on Sunday mornings with this little boy. She had no idea what had happened. When I told her who he was and where he'd gone, she started to cry. She just had no idea. She didn't understand the big picture. This church doesn't understand the big picture. You have no idea how many people have come through these doorways and heard the message that Christ is your Savior, that you need to accept him. You have no idea how many lives and families have been changed because of the message they heard in this church that started 75 years ago, 74 years ago. What we do know is that God has had his hand on this church. He's had his hand on that seven-year-old boy. He's had his hand on that guy in Hannah. And he's got his hand on Judah and on Habakkuk. We're not going to, between now and next week, we're not going to talk about chapter 3, but if you have the time, go home and read it. Uh, Judah, or, uh, Hezekiah has some questions in chapter 2, and then chapter 3 is a whole different situation. He didn't understand.
But God tuned him in, and we'll learn more about that next week. You know, back in John 3.16, we are reminded of this passage that the world knows. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten Son that whoever believed in him should not perish but have eternal life. The day that Mary and Jesus' siblings and all of his followers stood at the foot of the cross, they were probably thinking, why, God? What are you doing? Why is this happening to Jesus? What are you doing? That was one piece of the puzzle. And now over 2,000 years later, that plan is still being worked out. It's being worked out in our lives, in our children's lives, in our grandchildren's lives, and in the lives of the people who come through these doors, people that you don't even know. So God asked us to remember what he did. Remember that part of his plan. Remember it in a special way what I did for you 2,000 years ago. In a few minutes, we're going to celebrate communion. But I want to read where this begins in Luke 22, verse 14. When the hour had came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. And his apostles thought, what are you talking about? I don't understand what you're even... A little later, he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup. This is the cup, is the new covenant, the new agreement, the new understanding, and it's in my blood, which is poured out for you. As Habakkuk is frustrated and angry and confused, I'm sure that that day when people stood at the foot of the cross, they were in the same place. But they didn't understand God's plan. And we're a part of that plan all these years later. So in a few moments, we're going to serve the bread and the cup. This is not Alberta Beach Alliance Church's communion. This is the Lord's communion. And if you're a visitor with us this morning and if you've accepted Christ, then we invite you to join us. If you have never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, then I would ask you to just let the elements pass you by. Scripture is very clear about eating and drinking judgment unto yourself. If you think today is the day and you've been sitting here and listening and God is saying to you, today's the day you need to accept me. You need to accept the plan that I have for you. If you feel that way, then after the service, I'm going to sit down here and I'll wait for you to come and you and I can have a word of prayer together and I'll help you accept Christ and then we can have communion together. We are not sure yet, are we going to serve the bread and the cup at the same time? It's up to you. You're the boss. What's that? Okay, we'll serve the cup and the bread at the same time. Hold on to them till everybody's been served.